Um, welcome back. So uh, now we're going to have an, um, another interesting panel, which is called the differentiators for the streaming businesses. So we won't talk about uh, or discuss about the streaming or the future, st the future of streaming. We will talk about um, the future of the streaming businesses, which is... Um, Pretty, pretty tough market. So um, the questions like, um, what, what will make a streaming service unique in the future? And um, exactly. So um, the host of the panel will be um, David Meyer, which is, there he is, yeah. Um, long year tech journalist. Um, you wrote for a lot of publications like BBC, Guardian, I looked that up. And um, now you're one of the editors of the biggest or one of the biggest uh, tech blogs, GigaOM. So um, yeah, please welcome on stage um, David May and all the experts on streaming businesses. Thanks. Great. Um, so we've got, uh, you know, a suitably for uh, a panel on differentiation. We've got quite a differentiated group of people here. So I think uh, probably best if everybody just introduces themselves to start off uh, to say who you are and uh, what your business is. Thanks, David. Um, I'm Holger Weiss. I'm a CEO of uh, Alpeo. Alpeo is a streaming service uh, based and born in, in Berlin. Uh, originally started out as a multi-platform, multi-device type of music, standalone music services and migrated over the past uh, years, I have to say, in, um, in, in a streaming platform offering. And uh, we sold the company last year in April to Panasonic, so today the company is part of Panasonic Group. Thank you. Uh, I'm Peter Tonstar. I'm a Chief Commercial Officer of uh, WIMP, which is a streaming service that was launched back in 2010. Currently, it's been up and running in Scandinavia, uh, Germany and Poland. Um, but this week, we, we also released uh, information saying that we're launching a second brand, which is a uh, Tidal, uh, which is uh, targeting the US and UK markets. And then we'll see where we bring it from there. But that's... Uh, uh, lossless uh, hi-fi sound uh, quality service only uh, and that's basically where we're coming from with our let's say positioning within our existing markets as well so i look forward to talk more about that later thank you um <coughs> sorry hi uh, my name is reiner i'm the founder and ceo of loud um, we do uh, an online music magazine called loud the e that's something we started back in, in 1998. Um, and uh, for a couple of years now, we do a service called Loud FM, which is something we call user generated radio. Um, it's about 1500 curated online radio stations and the biggest uh, online radio network in, in Germany. Thank you. Um, my name is Francine Gorman, and I am the editor and project manager of something called the Nordic Playlist, which is a website that we launched in January of this year. It's a Nordic music export initiative, so we work with the export offices of each of the five Nordic countries to uh, promote their artists outside, of the, outside and inside of the region. Um, so the Nordic Playlist gets... We invite artists to curate playlists um, of their favorite Nordic artists, which we then program, create into a number of different streaming services. So our intention is to promote the music from our region and to very much encourage people to listen to music via monetized streaming services too. Okay. Um, thank you. Yeah. This one Best if you guys use that one. <laughs> yes. Um, actually, Francine, it would be good to start with you. Um, I think the first question, the, the best way to, to set the stage for this is, what do you think the state of differentiation is at the moment? I mean, I think a lot of people in the industry would say there's just really hardly any. Um, is, is that true? And I think this is something uh, for each of you to, uh, to answer. But beginning well, with you. I mean, differentiation in what respect in this, in this first? Well, in the sense of as you're a consumer, you see a panoply of services. Uh, is okay. there much of a difference between them? There, yeah, I mean, we primarily work with three different streaming services. So we work with Wimp, uh, we work with Deezer, and we work with Spotify. Um, we work with those three services because they all, they all offer a very similar catalog, and it's a catalog that we are encouraging our users to 
engage with and to listen to, but each one has um, a, a different thing that they can present as well. So the thing that we really enjoy about working with WIMP is the editorial aspect as well, because there's a real story to the content that we're creating um, and the way that we're trying to promote it to our audience. And so WIMP's very supportive of that. They're able to um, they have this really beautiful blog where they handpick what they want to feature on there and, and we work very closely with them to make sure that our content's being seen. Um, and then, I mean, with the other streaming services as well, it's just a, it's, it's mostly a case of um, visibility in different countries that, that attracts us to those. No, I, I was just um, about to, to comment on that, that this is exactly the issue that, I mean, I think from, from a content perspective, um, and you coming from the publisher side, content side, it's, it's natural that you're looking for reach, right? But your statement was that all the three services you're working with, they have almost the same catalog. And I think that is one of the fundamental issues from a consumer side, right? To see how, how you can differentiate and what makes a uh, service different, right? So, and I think that, um, there are fundamentally different dimensions of differentiators, right? One could be the catalog, the other one could be the, the, the way how music is presented. Third one is content in general. Why do we also only talk about music, right? There could be anything else beyond music, right? So functionality, feature, technology, channels, etc. And uh, it's, it's not always uh, only the content because I think differentiating in the content is very difficult. It's like mineral water and uh, you have a bottle for 20 cents and you have a bottle for 5 euros and inside is exactly the same and you only have to explain why one bottle is more expensive than the other one. Thank you. Um, when we launched our service back in 2010, there was already a big green uh, player that was quite present in the market. So for us, from day one, differentiation was, was kind of key. And the way we chose to do it, because no, no streaming services are actually charging for the content base because that's available for free uh, all over the place. Uh, so what we're charging for is either access to the mobile or any other device. But what we wanted to make sure to add on top was the manually curated editorial approach, uh, which was also mentioned. Um, and that's been the differentiator of, for our streaming service from day one. And we're really happy that that's been appreciated. Um, every time we're benchmarked toward other services, those things are recognized. So, so that's a confirmation to us that this is actually appreciated. And then we're kind of saying what we want to do is to, as much as possible, evolve around the actual music experience rather than delivering music as a background service or something else. So that works well in line with our editorial approach. Uh, so it's a combination of manual. It's a combination of... Um, external cu curated stuff as well, and also some, some suggestion engines in there. But uh, we've been expanding this. So recently we added like more magazine features, which go really in depth in terms of background on artists or, or, or content uh, music in itself. And that's seeming to also gain a lot of traction. And I can get back to it, but what we added on recently is then the, the sound quality, which is a huge point in itself. So maybe I'll get the chance to talk more about that. Uh, and thirdly, we also added now a, a vast library of HD video. So differentiation is, is key for us. But yes, the truth is we're all charging, let's say, 9.99 for uh, a same suite of uh, actual access and the same content. And then the question is, what happens from there? Yeah, Reiner, you, I mean, you've obviously in, a, in quite a different kind of streaming business. And uh, I mean, you've got, you've got the sort of the more catalog type uh, streaming business and you've got the more um, radio-like uh, streaming business. And I'm interested to know what you think of differ differentiation within that field. Yeah, exactly. Um, we do have a streaming service, but it's different to, to WIMP, obviously. It's not an on-demand streaming. Um, it's, it's a radio thing. And uh, obviously we believe very much in, in curation, human curation as a, as a differentiator. Complicated word. Um, uh, as I said, we, we have about 1,500 uh, uh, radio stations and they are curated by music experts, by, by, by music nerds in their uh, uh, genre and uh, so that, of course, is a, is a um, differentiator. 
and uh, what, what also is, is different to um, uh, services like WIMP or Spotify is the catalog as well, because um, people upload uh, their own music. We do have a, have a large database of music already, so you can go there, start your radio station with content that's already there. But um, if you don't find the music you want to play, you upload your own stuff and that generates a lot of content that isn't available on any other digital platform because people go and, and digitalize their rare vinyls, their, uh, I don't know, 70s northern soul stuff. And um, so I think that's a, a differentiator, maybe not for the mainstream market, but for, for music savants like, like us, like me. Um, it's, it's great to hear stuff that you don't get anywhere else. Um, I must apologize for this streaming. I can assure you it's not on demand. Um, the, so uh, I'm actually interested in the cura curation aspect. Uh, the whole sort of technical, um, the, the algorithm-driven curation uh, has, has, very, has a pretty bad reputation. And obviously, uh, some people are stepping in with a more human-centered approach. I mean, do you think that the technology might actually kind of catch up in that regard? Do you think that it's worth streaming services investing in sort of, you know, better algorithms, basically, more machine learning and, and, and so on? Uh, or do you think it'll always be uh, something that requires the human touch? We did it the other way around. We started out with the algorithm and understood that uh, it doesn't work without the human touch. And uh, I think uh, with all re respect, I, uh, we can claim that Alpeo was one of the stations, um, streaming stations that started very early with curated stations with a, a significant size of a, a own team. I mean, your team, your music managers, are it's, it's crowdsourced, right? People listening. We have them, uh, we have them in, in, in the company, all of them experts, etc. And we saw that comparing the, the usage of those manually curated station compared with those uh, made by algorithms, right? Uh, is, 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 there's a significant difference, right? So, and um, of course, I mean, see what, what uh, Spotify did with Econest, there's a lot of algorithm uh, based into what they're doing and you can improve this and it will be a fundamental part, especially, and that's something where we have to be careful that we don't mix up uh, Apple and oranges on by on-demand services. If you have 12 million songs, right, you cannot curate 12 million songs. You can only give a selection of that. We have 300 hand-curated uh, radio stations, um, but um, uh, that's something where algorithm definitely can help. But it never will work without uh, without the human touch, especially if it then goes to very special type of music areas where you simply know the background, uh, need the background. Yeah, I think uh, in our service where we always emphasize the, the manual curation um, as the key part, uh, but still we depend on, on the, let's say, suggestion engines to be a part of it to, to let's say, backfill uh, a, a huge uh, storefront. But, and on different things like genres, they work pretty well. But the sad thing about um, logarithms is that there is an element of uh, crowd uh, factoring in there. So people will potentially be listening to the same stuff, and that means a lot of great music will fall outside of the actual uh, logarithm. So I think from our perspective, it's, it's about being able to introduce people to music they didn't know they exist, and I'm not quite sure the, the technology will, will do the same job, but we're quite confident it won't. So using our, our manual curation has a total different touch towards the consumers. That's our experience. I mean, there is... I don't think we've ever experienced someone benchmarking our manual creation towards anything else saying technology wins. I mean, that hasn't happened. I'm sure it will improve over time, no doubt. Uh, and there will be a useful supplement, I would say. <laughs> well, I can, can only say pretty much the same, same things. Uh, I think um, uh, the algorithms will definitely improve, and it's it's funny to use them sometimes, but that's not the real thing. Um, music is about uh, it's about emotion, and I think uh, um, I'm I'm pretty sure that that humans will always be superior to to machines when it comes to selecting music. When it comes to surprise me um, when I use these these algorithm-based things, that's yeah, it's it's fun for a while, but but then. Uh, once you you click uh, a, a one like too much, if you know what I mean, uh, you 
get in one direction and then you're stuck. And, and uh, so uh, I, we, we strongly believe in, in human curation. Yeah, I'm going to completely agree with it as well. But I, I genuinely think that there's space for both. I think, I, as you mentioned, if you've got 12 million songs, then there has to be some kind of way of getting through them and organizing them and presenting them. But our whole task when we were coming up with the concept of the Nordic playlist was how to get these music fans to find the Nordic music and engage with it within those 12 million songs. And we came up with the idea that we should get somebody that they already know, somebody that they already trust the opinion of, so an artist, um, to pick a handful of songs. They only pick 10 songs each week, so it's a very kind of small corner of, of each of the streaming services. But um, we've found that it works incredibly well. And the way that we then promote the, uh, the content afterwards is very much in partnership with the artist that's curated it. So, I mean, if, if Nina Cherry tells you that this is my favorite new Swedish artist, then you're much, likely, much more likely to listen to it than if it pops up on a Spotify homepage saying, you listen to Kings of Leon, maybe you'll like Apex Twin, as it sometimes stands, you know. Um, but I think that the algorithms are definitely getting better, but I think we're kind of in a generation that experienced quite an unfortunate start to them, so there's a bit of a lack of trust, but... Yeah. Um, I'm also interested in how much... I mean, obviously one of the problems with differentiation is, well, it seems to me, is, you know, you've got a catalogue that you have to pay certain amount for it, blah, blah, blah. I mean, how much does the music side rather of, of the industry rather than the technology side, if you, if you can make that split, um, how, how much are, are kind of the rules of the game limiting how much differentiation can take place? And how much do people actually, uh, you know, do, do they want differentiation? Is it in, in, in the label's interests or, or, or not? I think one, one thing which is extremely important is uh, there is some, let's say, exclusive release going on on different streaming services, and typically that's some kind of bidding game, who pays most for the pre-release, that kind of stuff. And I think that's, that's in itself damaging for streaming services, because if you're running an on-demand service, people would expect to find their favorite music there either way. So they do a search, or they expect to see the new releases. And since it's not like one service is going to own all pre-releases, so then we're kind of battling on who has most pre-releases, when, how long, all that kind of stuff. But end of the day, the consumer loses out because they just want access to their music. So I think that's a bad way of differentiating. So, um, so in terms of, of, let's say, the label side, uh, how they support this, I mean, they are involved in, uh, in exclusive deals. So that's happening. Uh, many times it's driven by the artist, not by the label, uh, of course, as we know. Um, but I think end of the day, what we want is to see the same catalog in all services. That's the best way for the consumer. And then we add on top with curated playlists, curated um, uh, uh, suggestions, magazines, and, and so on. Yeah, thank you for the question and uh, keep me under control uh, when I'm now talking about the music industry because I think um, the labels fundamentally are one of the reasons that um, we have so many so similar services. I mean, uh, the on-demand services, you said it, they all 999, etc. They all have the same catalog, that's what you said. And then you're adding on editorial stuff and so on and so forth. Uh, for us, with a, with a non-on-demand uh, radio-like service, right? I don't know if, if you guys ever have read the, the rule sets that you have to apply if you want to do a slight interactive type of streaming service, it's literally insane, right? It is insane. And any type of innovation you ever would like to try, right, immediately links back into the licenses you have to pay. And even if those licenses haven't yet covered, if you come with the innovation in a service, the first thing that happens, the labels knock on, at, at your door and say, now your service is delivering more effort, not because of you, not because of your technology, not because of that, but because we built this great, fantastic artist infrastructure over the past 800 years, and this is why we now get more money from you, right? I mean, just, I mean it's not a joke. We are in, 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 in digital music streaming, and we're paying in our licenses packaging fees, right? Because when there was vinyl, they got a they got a fee for 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 the for the cover, right? And now we have to pay for. It. So anything, I mean, you could 
considers so many things, like, I don't know, this phenomenon we had two years, three years ago in the US, Turntable FM, right? Overnight, a fantastic way to promote music, to share music uh, with a strong gamification part, etc. There were 400,000 users attracted in only five weeks, right? And who killed it? The music industry. Because they said, oh, guys, fantastic. You pay now twice as much as on-demand service because there are so many people that uh, we want to earn from them. So I believe that if, as long as you're focusing only on music, right, a lot of differentiation in the, music, in, 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 in the streaming services over the next five to ten years will be massively interrupted and blocked by the music industry. Um, it's interesting you say that, as long as you focus only on music. Can you sort of maybe go in a little bit more into uh, the, the other stuff that you can see being added onto that? Mm. That was my point at the beginning. I mean, when we're talking about streaming services, then all the guys here on the stage and, and probably also here in the audience would understand music as such. And it's normal because we started out with music, but when we're talking about radio, Ryan and I, radio never was only music, right? I mean, there's a lot of talk radio, etc. cetera. Uh, On-demand streaming service makes a lot of sense with music, of course, and, and uh, but there, see SoundCloud, etc. all these type of uh, on-demand services where you have archives of BBC being uh, streamed there. So, and that's that's my point. And from, from us, from our point of view, from our, our peer point of view, um, there are different dimensions we we tried over the past five years and, and, and levels, and uh, one level of differentiation definitely is leaving this very close world of music license infra or controlled uh, ecosystem and, and going beyond. Because if you go to people who own their content um, and, uh, and have an interest in to multiply that, right, then uh, you usually find better conditions and that makes usually business cases easier and uh, it makes your differentiation bigger. Rainer, I, thought, I think you had some uh, points on live music that uh, we were talking about by email before. Yeah, yeah, thank you for, <laughs> for that question. Um, I definitely think that, that live content is going to be a, a differentiator. It's something we can see in the, in the television market already. People, crazy people like me, pay a lot of money a hell lot of money for watching live football. And, um, and we can see the same thing in, in audio streaming and radio services. We have a, a, um, an online radio in Germany called, called Sport1 FM. Um, and they uh, broadcast uh, uh, the, the German Bundesliga. And, uh, and this is the, I think it's the only uh, a nationwide online radio brand in, in, in Germany, isn't it? For, as a single station brand. And um, so I think that's, that's uh, uh, showing that, that live content, that is something you, that you, you cannot uh, uh, share, copy and, and, and skip advertising and, and things like that. So, um, and I hope that the same thing is uh, going to happen for, for music. Why isn't every, every club in, in Berlin, they have brilliant programs, uh, interesting music, why aren't they streaming uh, their, their stuff? And I'm, I don't mean, the, on, the only thing... Um, don't really ask that, right? Yeah, okay. I mean, there's a booth on site labeled GEMA, right? Yeah. I mean... Sorry? You cannot do that. You cannot simply go as a club and say, "I'm streaming my 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 music now in the in the world." Right? That that's that's exactly the restriction that I'm speaking about. Right? And sorry to correct you. I mean, it's not Sport 1. It was uh, uh, it was. Uh, um, uh, 1911, who invented that format, it, right? Yes, they built true. it over two years, and then Deutsche Bundesliga raised the licenses on the level that Sport 1 were the only one who could bid it. So, and that, that's my point, right? Yeah, it's something yeah. as long as you're into that uh, elements, then innovation, differentiation, it's extremely difficult to do, right? You're immediately illegal if you start to stream your uh, your concert from home, yeah, right? Because you would have to pay licenses for. That's definitely true. I mean, we're, we're, we're paying licenses. You, if, if you do radio, you have. Uh, if if you uh, if you do radio um, in in Germany, uh, I mean, you you uh, 
You don't have to deal with the labels directly if you do uh, in, uh, uh, linear radio form. Um, Can I just comment so that, uh, not to interrupt you, but, <laughs> but we, in Scandinavia, we've been doing what we call WIMP live sessions, which are recorded uh, acts that we put, uh, that we publish, uh, and that works fine. And then we've also done our first sort of live streams, which again, yes, from a product development perspective, that's something we'll definitely evolve more into. So I think that's, when I commented on catalog and exclusive, created content, uh, live concerts, that's definitely the way to go, I would say. Yeah. That's exactly the point. I mean, we're talking, we're, we're trying to talk about the future, and, and I, I'm still a positive guy, and, and I, I tend to, to think that all the labels, uh, they, they're going to get it someday. So, um, so I definitely think that, that live content, uh, be, it, be it streaming from club events or, or live concerts, um, um, is going to be important, especially in the long tail market. I don't, I don't talk about the big acts. You, you, you're going to be stuck in, in, in rights, things, that's, that's for sure. But, but uh, smaller bands, sm smaller acts, smaller artists, I think they, they can, can uh, do a lot, uh, a lot more things and, and uh, build their fan base by by streaming. I mean, nobody's not going to a concert because it's streamed live somewhere. So uh, that's always an, an, an add-on. And I think that's going to be really, really interesting. I mean, we just started a, a live feature on, on Loud FM, so we're, we're just uh, 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 building our first experiences with that. I think it's even, uh, even if it's not uh, a live concert, uh, uh, the fact alone that there's somebody uh, some some human uh, talking to you at the moment. The, the concept of, of of radio, of what FM radio was, I think that's a quality in itself. Um, that there's someone at the moment talking about the music he's playing, uh, uh, telling you uh, things that you didn't know, and and I think that's that's very 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 interesting. And, and and then it's not about it's not about quality and and professional radio productions and jingles and things like that it's it's about the content it's, it's about the, it's the about things the they, of it they as have well. to say yeah um francine i mean what i mean from your side obviously you know sort of a, the the curational side um you 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 sort of you know put things together for, to to promote in your case a particular scene i mean how much do you think there is how much scope do you think there is for curating for different listener use cases um, I mean, is it always, uh, you, you, you sort of, you don't know if the person's sort of sitting down or walking or doing this. I mean, do you think that there's scope for kind of curating for people who are doing sports, cu curating for people who are driving? And, and I know I'll come back to you later on that because I'm sure you have opinions on that. Um, but, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, th I absolutely think so. Perhaps not through my project because that's... Um that's not really the focus, but I think that works really well, like gym soundtracks, for example, just finding, and that can be an algorithm thing as well, it can just be finding a number of tracks with the same BPM that last for an hour, so you can, you can run, you can go. Um, but I think there's, there's absolutely scope for that, and I think that people are always looking for, well, obviously people are always looking for new music, and they're always in certain situations with a certain mood, that can be titled in some way. So if they want like a relaxed living room music or something like that, then it's nice to have somebody have already put that together so that you can already find it. But I think, um, yeah, I think I, I really think that curation is, is just such a useful tool now. It's just so essential to have something that's gonna filter through the masses. Um, but I think the most important thing that the streaming services have to focus on, if it's, going to be them that's going to be producing these playlists is that they have to have um, a certain voice. They have to have a trustworthy reputation when it comes to the way that they're curating things so that people will almost rely on the content that they're having placed in front of them and feel happy and confident to access it. Uh, have you got thoughts on that? Obviously, uh, having sold to Panasonic Automotive and all of that, and uh, thoughts on automotive, and, and perhaps also things like wearables and stuff. I mean, is there scope scope there as well? 
Yeah, sure. I mean, um, it's true. We, we sold uh, Alpeo to uh, a unit in Panasonic uh, that is, uh, um, is, is uh, in automotive, um, is an automotive supplier. And that's, that's where we found our differentiation over this journey to see how can we stand out. And Alpeo, on the one hand, I said this always was great. Uh, and is music cur curation and a very strong team of, of, of music managers and, and on the other side a very strong technology company who always was focusing to do uh, uh, cross-channel streaming or platform-based st uh, uh, streaming. So, but um, yeah, it's, it's true. I mean, it, and that's something where we believe that um, over the next years, the so f from a fundamental point of view, media consumption, I'm 100% convinced that in four to five years, streaming will be the absolute standard, right? No matter if this is for music or pictures or videos or whatsoever. We, don't, we will not see the classic terrestrial radio station disappear, right? But we will have a very strong impact of those streaming services. That's something that if you see what happened in the internet over the past five, six years in video streaming, right? No one ever had considered that uh, this would be possible to transfer this amount of data on a, on a, on a, on a hourly base, right? On your smartphone, on your desktop, et cetera, et cetera. And that's something that I learned 15 years in, in this technology and in, in, in this industry building uh, software companies is that that's to be solved, right? So, and if we now see where could we differentiate and where is the way or where is an area where people spend a lot of time per day, maybe not too much in Berlin, right? But right outside of Berlin, in, in other countries, etc., it's the car. And the car is, from our point of view, the last not perfectly connected environment in your daily lives, at least, let's say, in in developed countries, if you want to. And that's something we're focusing on, and, and this is where we're developing uh, scenarios, use cases, programs, content, um, um, for specialized use in cars, but as it's a cloud service, streaming service, it's outside of the car, inside of the car, uh, but uh, uh, with, the, with a very strong focus into that. We're actually running pretty low on time, so I, I, I do want to ask you something, um, which is that one thing we've not discussed is, I mean, we're, we may be days away from Apple making a big announcement uh, of, after the, its Beats acquisition, um, and it almost feels like everyone's waiting for the other shoe to drop, and I'm just sort of, uh, obviously because uh, you, uh, you know, help run a, a, an on-demand platform, I'm interested to know your thoughts on that, and is everyone kind of just waiting for that shoe to drop, or how's that working? Thank you. Um, well, first of all, I just want to add one point, and that's uh, true differentiation is only proven if you get people to pay extra for something, uh, in my view. And WIMP is one out of two services who actually did it now with the, with the better sound quality. So the WIMP Hi-Fi, which is priced at two times at regular premium, so 19.99. And we see huge traction and interest around sound quality in combination with the creation, of course, but sound quality in itself is a fantastic message to, to talk about. It's fantastic towards artists, labels, consumers. Uh, and the traction we're seeing is the whole base of us now expanding into new markets on, on let's say, the, the super premium level, sound quality and other things. Yes, I, I, I always look forward to the um, Apple announcement shows and, uh, and even more when they acquired the beat. So, so it's gonna be interesting to see. I mean, we obviously expect big things from them in the future. They, I mean, they have unlimited resources per definition. It's just a question of how they use them. Um, so I'm sure they will deliver great services. Uh, I, I would rather see, let's say, new exciting releases from Apple than any other competition because they kind of live in their space and they have fans or they have non-fans. And uh, I think it's just going to drive and, and help the industry. So streaming suddenly bumps up 10 levels on the, on the global agenda within tech and uh, and potentially music as well. So yeah, I get the feeling that if you're not differentiated, you're probably a lot more scared. If, if you don't have things like the high quality, yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's a it's the the game is getting tougher, no doubt. Mm. Um, and does anybody have a question? I've got one more question I'd like to ask, but somebody from the audience should have a go. It's it's more of a quick comment though, uh, because everyone, uh, yeah, everyone. Can, Hello. 
we are adding this, we are adding HD videos, we are adding this and that. Uh, but in my opinion, less is more is another differentiator. And if you remember the good old days of a good record store, it was almost as important what you didn't carry to be, build the profile of your store than the stuff that you did carry. And there's no doubt that no one in the world needs 30 million tracks. So, I mean, with Apple now getting into the field of streaming services as well, I'm strongly convinced it will still take a while until any one of these services is going to be profitable just by the streaming itself. And then there may be one or two who are going to be profitable and the rest are going to disappear. So I think the remaining market for streaming is going to be divided into niche services. And the approach of 30 million plus, 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 plus is going to be irrelevant in a few years. Yeah. I absolutely agree. It's uh, in a time where, where all music is available everywhere, anytime. Um, that's, that's where the value of curation comes in. That's where radio services step in. And um, that's exactly it. People, there are a lot of people that don't want to, to select and choose uh, all the time. They just want to, to turn it on, turn the music on. And that's that's what radio does. So, um, yeah, I pretty much think the same. The same. Um, I have two questions based on the pricing. Um, first, I want to know why do all services set the same price? I mean, you said there might be restrictions by the music industry or the labels, but I'm not sure if I really understood them. And the other thing is, why is the price exactly 9.99? I don't know, is it of economic reasons or did someone just decide it's 9.99 and everyone follows? I don't know. <laughs> so first thing, why are they the same prices? And the other thing, why is it 9.99? I think that's an extremely good question. And uh, it is really, really strange. I mean, streaming is now in the fourth, approaching the fifth year of commercial business and we're still basically selling stuff for 9.99 and it's not even 9.99 it's 9.99 pounds 9.99 euros so it's we're kind of stuck in this thing but yeah there is some backdrop where obviously when you do agreements with labels they have some views on uh, on the value of their label pool so that kind of defines some some levels but from there on I think as an industry we need to take self criticism of having being we haven't done enough on the business development to evolve from there i mean a simple comparison is uh, we have a CMO who came from Coca-Cola. He's always talking about the free cup strategy. It's small, medium, large. In streaming, it's either free or 9.99. Uh, I think we, we took the step now because we launched uh, Hi-Fi at 1999. So I would at least say we're driving that evolution now, and then we'll see. But yeah, it is odd. Maybe to add to that, I think the 9.99 coming from the 99 cents from iTunes. So somehow people think that is uh, that's digital. <laughs> And the other thing is, it, it cannot be commercially reasonable because none of the streaming services are profitable. So. <laughs> but I mean, who decided that it's 9.99? Like the first streaming service or? Yes. Okay. And <laughs> But then, yeah, I don't understand why did the other one not try to set another price? <laughs> it's like gas stations, they all have the same price. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then we're back to the whole differentiation discussion, I think, so yeah. yeah. But it's a good, good question again. Do, do we... Oh, yeah. Hi, my name is Andreas. Uh, great panel, thank you. Um, I'm wondering um, if and maybe you're the wrong people because you're biased, but uh, the whole question of bundling, you know, you're talking about Apple and um, game changing. So do you, do you feel, and you know, Panasonic obviously, do you think that's the future? Do you think the, the streaming services in the end will be some kind of feature rather than stand alone? Do you, do you have an opinion? I have experience with it, but um, I think they, there's no doubt bundling has, uh, has helped streaming services become what they are now. And if you look at any given market, they don't really scale until there is some big bundling going on with telco or, or similar. Um, it is a challenge because when you bundle, per se, consumers are getting something for free. So it's, it's basically falling back to the premium perspective of, of music. And for us being a premium brand, we, we want to, let's say, differentiate from that perception of being free, and then we have to add value and, and charge. But we are doing bundles, so um, it is a 
is a tricky one. <laughs> um, yes, and in part I would agree. <laughs> but uh, we also bundled a lot at the beginning and uh, the experience was not too good um, because we, we shipped millions of millions, 50 million devices, and uh, the conversion is, is, uh, is difficult to, to get. Um, but, and that is something where I have a big but here, um, I agree with your hypothesis that streaming services who bundle will win as long as the hardware and the streaming services are in the, in the same hand. And that is something what makes this acquisition. I mean, Apple had iTunes, right, before. And if you look iTunes up in the balance sheet of Apple, it doesn't appear because compared with the hardware business, it's so small what they're doing. And uh, so they don't have to earn money with the streaming service. And that makes them superior. And that makes you challenged by them because you don't have own hardware. So meaning that you cannot live from a good margin on hardware. You have to live from your own streaming service. But luckily, there is more hardware than Apple. So we have many, many other great companies to, to partner up with. Oh, no, work with but that's so. not my point. But you don't, you, them, or whoever, yeah, yeah, no, other, we have you don't earn with the hardware. Absolutely. Apple is selling hardware. Yeah. Earning, I don't know, 300% margin on it, mm. easy, and they pay the uh, the the licenses uh, for for their streaming services and never earn money with them. It's true. Okay. Uh, do we have time for just for one question? I guess just for one more if question. Anyone from the one? audience? There's another one in front of you. Yeah. Oh, just in front of you. I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Um, I have a question, as mobile are the front-end devices of, of streaming mainly, um, do you uh, follow Apple patents and other companies' patents on uh, mood identification and predictive apps and what's your take on predictive apps that will identify which music to play automatically based on the context I'm in and the mood I'm in? It was difficult to understand. You said, do we follow the pattern to identify moods by the use of other content? Yeah, do you work on predictive apps? Oh, okay. Um, yes and no. I mean, um, anytime you're using an algorithm for, for categorizing music, somehow there's a predictive part in it, right? Because you say, okay, this song suits to that one, and this is how you're building that. Um, but we, our PO, at the moment, we don't have a focus too much on that. We have rather focus on, on algorithms that, 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 that have a predictive element in terms of your general user behavior, right? That's not too much apps. This is how you're moving links back to the car, right? Then we understand how you're driving, where you're driving, and, and giving you the, the right sound according to that. Um, on the other side, another comment would be that all that is nice. Right, and there are a lot of apps trying that. There are mood apps, and there are whatever uh, type of services. At the end, I'm doubting if this will be a real differentiator. Right, I think that's a layer, that's an element of something that we might gonna see, uh, but it, it cannot survive standalone. No? Great. Thank you all very much. You're all on stage um, for this Thank wonderful you. discussion. Just, I just yes. wanted to, to invite anybody in here to, to make their own radio stations. We have this handwritten invitations for anybody who sat in here instead of being outside in the sun. Thank you. Great.